into this. Get my old date up there because I've been teaching this stuff for a little while. Um, but I update. And the kind of interesting thing, guys, is that I did this presentation and iteration of this presentation a few years ago for um, one of our professional development days where we come and have meetings and do different like kind of sessions with each other on different topics. Sometimes it's like how to, you know, teach certain things better or how, you know, different uh, practices you can use in the classroom. Uh, I try, I offered to do a session on, uh, on this budgeting, personal finance and investing in, uh, investing in general and investing in retirement. And the session could hold I don't know. They they capped it at about thirty people, but I said I don't. You know I don't care. We can pack the room out if if more people want to be there. It doesn't uh, it doesn't bother me. Uh, it just may be that the people have to stand or whatever. I think we get like you know forty or something people in there. Um, so this was stuff that like uh, your teachers were like coming in to hear because for them. And, and for everybody, finances are a real matter of importance in their lives. I mean, whether you like it or not, right? Whether you're, you feel like you're managing them in a good way or not, that they are a way that, uh, that we are affected. And I put here, you know, thinking about how I wanted to communicate this information I put here that the, the secret is there is no secret. There's no special secret sauce. There's no secret recipe. Okay. I'm not going to tell you if, if anybody comes up with, I, I started um, noticing as I would like kind of read up on other like financial like information and plans to, you know, kind of, get to a place of financial stability. I started reading stuff and I'm like, kind of hoping for something novel, something new, something that I hadn't really heard before. And I'm like, I'm, I'm really getting a lot of the same stuff. And I was talking to my dad about that. And we discuss a lot of this um, material and try to help people with this in uh, kind of different ways. Um, and so we talk about this together a lot. And um, he was saying, well, you know, but that's that's good, actually, is because what that's telling you is that lots of people are who are trusted are saying the same things. He goes, you know, it, it would be actually kind of suspicious if somebody comes and they tell you they have some sort of um, secret program for for building wealth right it's like those guys on youtube that they're like you see this car you wonder how i got this sweet car you know and it's like this this teenager in his garage you know type of thing <laughs> and i don't i don't have any problem with rich teenagers but he it's these like kind of wealth scams but what I'm telling you is, is not anything that's, that's, this is the least exciting. Well, I don't know. In the sense, it's the least exciting way to do it. It's not quick. It can be very like fulfilling and empowering. So it can be exciting in that way, but it's, it's the least exciting way. And it, it's the least novel. There's nothing, there's no secret there's no get rich quick. There's no things like that, right? There, it just doesn't work that way. But uh, this is uh, consistent. It's true because what, what a lot of people are expecting when you start talking about finances is they're expecting something 
up front to, to give them um, a trick. There, this is not uh, tricks or gimmicks, right? So that's that's kind of what I'm getting at with there. Um, but but yes, the, the people who get on YouTube and they're like, you got to generate a stream of passive income. Now you can do that. There are some ways of, of doing that legitimately, but they're not... Um, they're not easy to, you know, build that consistently. You'd have to, it's like people always want you to, they're like, well, have you thought about starting your side business? I'm like, you know, the quicker and cheaper way of, of having a side business is getting a second job and delivering pizzas part-time or the equivalent. It's like, instead of trying to build a business from the ground up, and figuring out a business model that works or having an online business, why don't you just take a few extra hours a week and get a second job and start generating some income that way? You know, it's like, I don't have anything against someone who's starting an online business. You know, I've looked into aspects of those things before, but they, they take an incredible amount of focus and time and attention to build the infrastructure of something like that, which can be done. However, the time, you know, it's just cost benefit. You have to decide whether or not that's, that's worth it to you. Or if it's, if you're looking for some extra income, then a second job is, is an easier way to, uh, to do that. It's, it's the less, it's the less uh, sexy way to do it. You know, it's, it's easier to have like, you know, try to get your YouTube channel going and all that type of stuff and generate, you know, but it's not as easy as people think, even the people who uh, generate those, uh, those passive income. So anyway, showing you guys this, we're living at a time that's economically, uh, unprecedented in the sense that most human history, the average people have been poor, okay, under $3 a day. Change around here in the Industrial Revolution, this, this investment in capital, a change of ideas, change uh, in some thinking. And now we're living up here in $130 a day. Okay, so in a sense, <clears throat> economically, this is the best time in human history. Uh, not that we don't have our problems, but it's kind of a counterintuitive thing because while we're at the best time in human history, while Americans, and I don't minimize anybody's problems, but while Americans experience an incredible amount of wealth, and I'm talking about average people, not, not, Jeff Bezos, okay? While they experience an incredible amount relative to history and relative to the rest of the world, Americans are, there are some poor Americans, but in general, Americans are not poor, they're broke. And again, I leave, there are exceptions, but my point is how there's kind of a, not a contradiction, but a tension between the fact that the wealthiest time in human history, but human beings are struggling for financial stability. And let me read you guys a, a quick story from a book, and I've actually footnoted it here, of this guy who is a financial coach, and he was working with this, uh, he was working with this couple and the guy uh of the couple uh they were married he wasn't as serious and he could tell he wasn't as serious and so you know when someone's not really working with you as far as you know wanting you to actually help them with their finances they they may you know may not really want to be there and may not really be ready to fully get serious about it um and so this guy wasn't paying any attention. Then all of a sudden he called back and wanted to meet again. And he was, he was a lot more intense and a lot more focused. And uh, the financial coach guy was like, huh, I wonder what's going on. And so this guy told him a story about what he had experienced that changed 
his his perspective. And this guy named Michael was going over to his aunt's house to help mow her lawn. Now she was like gone and uh, she was uh, going to something, I think for like some church thing. She was like in her eighties, a little old lady uh, going to church. And so he was going over to this aunt and, you know, it was his favorite aunt and he loves her a lot. And, uh, and he, so he's, he's mowing her lawn and then he decided to, uh, he, finished up and he decided to go in get some water and he, and he was going to get himself something to eat. And he opened the, the refrigerator and there's like nothing in there except a few items. And then he tried to open the pantries and the cupboards and they're all bare and empty. And he's like, starts to get this kind of eerie feeling about it. And then he opens one final cabinet and he sees four cans of <coughs> canned dog food. And, uh, and the financial coach who's hearing this story is kind of like, so what's the, okay, I'm not, I'm not putting the pieces together. What's the big deal? I understand it's weird. She didn't have food, but what, what's the significance of the dog food? And he said this last line down here, Chris, my aunt doesn't own a dog. And so what happened was this lady, great lady, you know, who was very nice, spent her life taking care of and serving other people, ended up with her life, uh, at the end of it, going hungry in in the United States, it, it, trying to survive off of dog food because it was the most nutritious food that she could afford. And so there are times where people, especially toward retirement, where they can't work, where they are in a place of financial desperation, and when you're in that place, there's a sense where you can't be free because you are constrained by your finances and your circumstances. And so this is supposed to be motivation about um, how to get serious get serious about, about a plan for your money. Most people it, it don't do that. Most people, their money just is kind of happens. But, but what we're going to, to work toward or what I'm going to suggest and show you how to do is to have a specific plan for your money. And then once you do that and you build that discipline consistently, and you work that plan, you end up in a place of financial freedom and ability. Uh, chat. So uh, let me give you guys some facts. Uh, you guys aren't millennials, but uh, <clears throat> millennials or my generation, but this will probably be true of your generation too. <clears throat> Hopefully not you guys, but, but of your group in general. Only 24% of millennials demonstrated basic financial knowledge when tested. Okay, so most most people don't know that much about finances. Uh, well, I, not most. I, well, yeah, most people don't. They they wouldn't. To the, a lot of people, this area is a little bit like scary. They kind of like don't want to know about it. And I, when I say scary, I mean just it's a little bit intimidating or overwhelming. But it's actually fairly simple. Yes, you can get into the deeper complexities of these things, but it's, it's more empowering once for, once you have the knowledge, then you feel better. You feel more in control. Um, nearly 30% of millennials are overdrawing on their checking accounts. Okay. And then money is the leading cause of stress in the United States. So 
you want to eliminate, and it may not, you know, this year, may, there may be other leading causes of stress, but, but actually, no, money would still, I think, probably be the leading cause of stress, even this year, because a lot of things people stress about is in one way or another tied to money. But 30% of millennials are overdrawing on their checking account. Uh, an overdraw or an overdraft fee, overdrawing on your checking account is that you don't know how much money is in your checking account and you spend more than you have and the bank will cover you. They'll allow you to make the purchase. However, they will charge you a fee. Sometimes they let you go. I've, I've done it once and they said they're like they understood and it was you know it was an act you know an accident um not a common thing that happened but a lot of people walk around and they don't have know how much money they they actually have month to month and to tell you the truth a lot of people don't want to know i know people who basically avoid figuring out the simplicity of online banking they they have a they'll put their money in the bank but they don't want to know how much they have in there and um come up with all kinds of excuses i i don't know i have an old password on an old phone i can't you know i can't figure it out can't figure it out don't trust it don't blah 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 all that stuff and then consistently overdraft on the money that's in their checking account which means they outspend their checking account and when you outspend your checking account, yes, the bank will cover you, but they'll also charge you a fee somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to $30 every time you do that. So people, and then this is people like millennials, I guess, are people like my age. Into, you know, the, the 25 to, to like 35 age range that they don't know how much money they have in some cases they don't want to know and about a, almost a third of them are outspending their checking account such that they have to pay the bank a 30 dollar fee consistently and then money is a it's a leading cause of stress money is a leading issue in divorce right if you 80%, I believe, of divorces are attributed to issues over money. Now, there's a lot of, you know, more complicating factors in a divorce. But let me just say it positively this way. Should you choose to be married... and follow these things consistently and marry someone, you know, use your, your brain and, and make a good choice, choose wisely in a spouse and someone who can be a, a teammate in these things, you will have eliminated basically it, your chances of divorce by 80%. Okay, I know there's a little bit more to that, but that's another way to think about it. That if you can get a handle on this stuff now and then find someone who can, who's a, a wise choice in a mate and also is a, uh, disciplined person in general, but also financially then you will have done yourself a favor toward your marriage. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, don't, don't, and let me just throw a piece of advice there. Don't marry somebody who's financially undisciplined. If you can't live with that, don't marry somebody who's financially undisciplined because then you'll have to go through the the emotional and family and financial disaster of divorce. And uh, it's not something that anybody planning to marry wants to, or plans to go through. But money is connected with that as well.
When asked, where would you go for $1,000 in unplanned expenses, only 36% of respondents said that they had the money in savings. 64% uh, would have to go elsewhere. 63% of Americans do not have enough savings to cover a $500 emergency. And <clears throat> anybody who, who has ever owned a car knows how, or, uh, or a house or both, knows how quickly a $500 emergency can come up, right? But 63% of Americans don't even have $500 to cover those things. But something breaks on the car, something breaks in your house, it can easily be close to or even above $500. And so that means that Americans typically are living paycheck to paycheck, meaning they spend up the money of their paycheck one month, and then, the, and then they, they don't have anything left over, and they're waiting until they get their next paycheck to have money. And there's, there's no savings there. And so what that means is they have all their money kind of going toward whatever it is they're paying for, their responsibilities, their meeting, their bills and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, all it takes is one $500 emergency. And now you've got not necessarily a crisis, but you've got what we call a situation. You've got a problem. Because now you have the added financial burden, but also the, the stress of how do we handle this, this 500 bucks, right? This thousand dollar emergency. So here are the steps, right? I'm gonna give this to you. We'll go over it more in depth on other days where we'll, we'll walk through these one by one. But basically this is it, here, here are the steps. And if you follow these, Consistently, I understand there may be questions as to the, the particulars of these things. But if you follow these consistently, this will get you to the place of retirement as a millionaire. But they have to be followed fully and in order. Okay, they're called baby steps, right? Now, this guy on the left, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this movie. This is a movie with Bill Murray. Bill Murray's funny, and uh, he's like in Groundhog Day and stuff. But this movie is called uh, What About Bob? And he has this. It, he goes on vacation to find his psychiatrist because he feels like he can't do anything without him. And the psychiatrist starts to kind of go crazy uh, because Bob's driving him nuts. But anyway, the psychiatrist writes this book called Baby Steps. And so Bob walks around and he tells himself, baby steps, baby steps, you know, that, that he just keeps repeating that to himself. So that's what you need to do is you, you just need to focus on one step at a time. Now for you guys, as uh, older teenagers, young adults, your baby steps are a little bit different. Okay. But this is basically, basically it. Like they're, they're a little bit different as a teenager. There's, there's a little bit of a modified version of this, which I'll share at another time, but here's what it is. Okay. Thousand dollar emergency fund. Okay, this is money that you get together uh, as quickly and legitimately as possible. So this is like you have a garage sale, you sale, you sell some stuff, you uh, work and 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 find and and or save up as quickly as possible. A thousand dollar emergency fund. Okay. Now, what that $1,000 emergency fund does is it protects you from having to use your already precious amount of money per month um, on unexpected circumstances, okay? Now, what the $1,000 emergency fund does is it protects you. So you have something, you're driving along your car, Boom, $700 problem. Now, normally that's a possible financial crisis for, your, for you or your family. But if once you have the $1,000 emergency fund, you've protected yourself and you've protected your money. And 
then you, what you do is you spend the seven hundred dollars, you again build the thousand dollar back up, and you start over. But it's kind of odd. I don't know why it is this way, but once you have that thousand dollar emergency fund, it seems like those expensive circumstances that pop up, they don't seem to pop up as much anymore. I don't know why, but it kind of is repellent to those things. I, it, It's not always, but it, people have noted that to be the case. So $1,000 emergency fund as quickly and legitimately as possible. Step number two, eliminate all debt except debt to pay the house for, on the mortgage of a house. And that is <clears throat> all debt, student loans, credit cards, personal loans, car loans, any payday loan, any, any type of debt whatsoever. You put it in one big pile and you eliminate the debt using what Dave Ramsey called the debt snowball. The debt snowball is you start at your smallest debt and you pay it off and that gives you some momentum. And then you take the money that was going to that and you pay off the, and you start attacking the next one. And then once you've done that, you take the money that was going to both of those, you start attacking the next one. Now, this is the crucial step in here is you have to have a budget. You have to have a plan for your money. You have to have a plan every month that you, and if you're married, you talk about it with your spouse. If you're single, you talk about it with uh, somebody who, who provides accountability for you as a friend who you can trust to kind of work uh, as you work through this program, okay? And you, the goal is you, you don't have any other savings because saving while you have debt is, uh, you're kind of wasting time. It, it's that you, it would be faster because the debt is taking away from your, your money no matter what you do. So it's better not just to have the $1,000 emergency fund that protects yourself and gives you a sense of urgency and intensity to pay off all debt. There is a study called, uh, it, it came out in a book called Everyday Millionaire. Okay. It was, a, it's the largest study of millionaires in North America. It discovered some pretty interesting things about millionaires. Uh, most millionaires in America, very, only a very small percentage of them, I want to say less than 5% of millionaires have inherited any money whatsoever. Some of them have inherited money, but not enough to make them millionaires. And some of them, and they, these are people who work normal jobs. Okay. They're not necessarily CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. They're not Jeff Bezos. They're not Elon Musk. Okay. They're not Warren Buffett. They're regular people, but the, so they didn't inherit any money. And they didn't start out as millionaires and they didn't necessarily come from wealth. The greatest single common denominator, meaning the factor that all these everyday millionaires tended to share, was that they got and stayed out of debt or avoided debt in the first place. Okay. And so you eliminate all debt. You don't go into debt again. Uh, you don't use and this is going to, we're going to be where people maybe struggle a little bit in these first two steps as well. But also, I'm going to recommend you don't use a credit card. You, you buy, in reality, with the money that you have, you don't buy on credit with money that you don't have and have to pay back at interest. So, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth later. Then, <clears throat> once you've done that, you save three to six months of expenses. Okay. So you have three to six months of expenses that are your final kind of emergency fund. This is like if you have some sort of your, some, you or someone in your family has some sort of uh, like big medical expense, some problem that you if you lose like a job or income, you have three to six months where you have created a buffer of protection for yourself while you find another source of income. OK, then number four, once you've done that, OK, once you don't have debt payments you've given yourself basically a raise, okay? And then once you have the, the protection of three to six months of expenses, you have also protected yourself against 
um, a lot of things that happen to you. So you're in a place where you're making more money. You don't have debt payments. You have less stress and you feel safer and more secure. And then you're at a place where you're ready to invest 15% in retirement. And we'll talk about how to do that. And uh, you don't just throw it into the stock market. You don't just say, I'm going to invest in Amazon, Coca-Cola and McDonald's. No, you're going to invest in things that are uh, that are safer, right? Which we'll start looking into the possibilities for that. And by the way, I do not give financial advice. I do not give investment advice. I give investment descriptions of here is, you know, how one could do it. But I do not tell you, give directives about what you should do with money that you invest, okay? Um, so to make myself uh, lawsuit proof in case somebody throws in a money at a bad investment and then says, hey, my hoarder told me to invest and I lost a bunch of money. So uh, so anyway, I don't give investment advice. I talk through a process of what investing could look like and you decide um, whether or not it's sound and research it out and decide what you want to do. But anyway, uh, then you invest 15%. That will continue to grow consistently over time um, if you put it in uh, into certain growth stock mutual funds, okay? And that will grow and will be eventually the money that you will live on in retirement. And then if you have kids, you save for your children's college fund, okay? If you don't have kids, you skip, skip that step and you work on throwing extra money because you won't have payments from debt. You're going to throw extra money at paying off your house early. You can save yourself a bunch of time and money in paying off your house early because you save yourself in future interest on the money that you pay off on your house. One of the biggest payments that people have, actually probably the biggest payment people have is paying for their house. But once your house is paid for and you fully own it, you now allow yourself to basically have at your disposal uh, several, usually several thousand dollars of extra income because now you don't have to pay for the house anymore. So you have all this extra money and that's where you continue to build wealth. And if you want to give generously, which I recommend that this is, this is something that you can use to, uh, if you're thinking, well, okay, well, this, you know, some people think this type of thing is, is selfish that you're in doing this, these things for yourself, that you're not helping others. I disagree. I think that in doing these things for yourself, you are one disengaging from ever being a burden on others. You're taking care of your own house and your own business. And you're putting yourself in a position where you can be generous and helpful to others who, who need it, right? And you can help them uh, in a, you know, and you can, you can give, you know, generously. And then that's what a lot of people find a lot of uh, satisfaction in that. Once they have the money, they're like, you know, it, the, the having the money is not the, the exciting part. The exciting part is actually being able to, uh, to help others. But then at that point, and, and throughout this process, you get varying degrees of financial freedom, where you're at a point where, uh, where you have earned your freedom. Debt is not freedom. Debt means someone else has a say to your money, therefore a say to your labor, therefore a say to your mind and body before you do. And I'm saying, here's a way out of it so that you can get to not just financial stability, being a place where you're stable, but a place where you're free and you can live the life of doing whatever you want.